All right, welcome. You made it, impression show. Beautiful masks, it's awesome. I'm Rick Roth from the Ink Kitchen, and on behalf of the Ink Kitchen and Impressions, bring you the shop talks, free information. There's a whole schedule over there. Believe it or not, most of it is not canceled. Our speakers are gonna be here. And um, I've got with me Kevin Koth and Dave Macon, and uh, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves, and then we're gonna talk about some common uh, screen issues and some easy fixes, and I'm gonna ask some questions, then I'm gonna open it to the floor, and you can ask these uh, geniuses um, any question you want. You can try to stump them. And then afterwards, we will have a giant uh, pool of emulsion, and they're going to wrestle uh, like mud wrestling. All right. Thanks. Kevin? All right. So I'm Kevin Kauf with Chromaline. I've been with Chromaline for the past 12 years. I cover the Midwest Territory. Uh, prior to Chromaline, I worked for CFAR, the mesh manufacturer as well. So my entire background is basically the screen room and everything about screen making um, in its full capacity. And my name is Dave Macon. I got into the industry back in 1992 and I've been with Saudi for approximately, I think this is my 15th year now. So background is, is uh, the graphic side, the four color process and half tone reproduction. So um, training some of the SPTF classes and things when they used to hold those classes back in the 90s. So uh, it's, it's a lot of fun doing what we do, teaching what we teach, and hopefully we lead you guys in the right direction. All right, so I'm gonna start so when I go into a shop, a lot of times, almost you know, 90% of the time there's an issue. Uh, you know, things could be better. And the things I see usually are bad squeegees, um, not, ink not cured, and bad screen tension. So <laughs> do you see bad screen tension? And what else do you see when you go in a shop that's like the most common errors? I mean, there's no university to go to for this industry or whatever. A lot of people are trying to figure it out. So what are, what are some common mistakes? Because as you may know, Facebook isn't the greatest place to learn screen printing. Right, yeah. I mean, I, I think the number one thing that I see when I go into shops is underexposure. I think that 80% of the shops in the country pretty much are underexposing their screens because they want to get better resolution. They're afraid that if they go too long that they're going to overexpose their screens. Um, but in most cases, in most shops, you could increase your exposure time by 5 to 10 percent and just have a more durable stencil. You're not going to lose the resolution that you're uh, struggling to get. So many things to talk about. Right. I would say one of the first things that we see would be coding technique. Yep. You know, uh, your coding trough, understanding your sharp edge versus your round edge. How do I build a proper emulsion over mesh thickness? You know, to, because with today's emulsions, um, unlike emulsions of the past, these new photopolymers like to cling to themselves more than they like to cling to the mesh. So you got to make sure you, your emulsion over mesh thickness is built correctly. And what I see a lot of the time as we do this is which side do we start on? How fast do we coat the screen? Um, you know, observation really helps a lot when you have a professional come into your shop. They can look at it, help you understand if you're coding too fast, it might be your pinholing issue. You know, you may have addressed it with chemicals or, or degreasers, but yeah, you still have a pinholing issue. When we code our screens, we like to teach and, and instruct that you, know, you should be going about six inches per second. That's kind of slow. It, your first passes should be from your substrate side, which is basically gonna push all the air out of your mesh, and then you're gonna flip to the, to the squeegee side where now you're gonna build your emulsion over mesh. Your, your thickness is actually going to protrude to the substrate side, which is where you want your emulsion to do the work with the fabric to give you a proper coverage of your ink and, and less mesh interference. So, so, Kevin, if you want to get proper exposure, um, you ask on Facebook, right? Is that where you find the information on your exposure times? Uh, I think Facebook is one of the worst tools for figuring out everything. I know it's, it's one of the go-tos for a lot of people, but just like we were saying before about the question that people ask, which emulsion should I use for my shop? You know, what's the best emulsion that's out there? And honestly, doing a Facebook poll is the worst way of finding out the right tool, you know, the right product for your particular process in your shop. You know, talk to one of us, talk to your emulsion reps and have us come in there. But 
the ink system that you're using, the exposure system, your environment, all of those things factor into Even which, what you're doing for printing, right, makes a big difference. Abs absolutely. So all of those things factor into which emulsion you should be using. All of us make more than one emulsion. If we could just make one emulsion and it did everything, by, I mean, our lives would be so much easier. But unfortunately, it's just not, it's just not able to happen. So, I mean, knowing your system, your process, instead of just saying what my neighbor is using is what I should be using, that's probably the worst way to do it, you know? <laughs> Actually, it's funny. Whenever you see, like on Facebook or a forum, someone say, I use X emulsion, it works for everything. It's always a person that works there by themselves and is on Facebook in the middle of the day when they should be printing stuff. <laughs> so, what it, so if you have underexposure, which is pretty common, what, what would the signs be? Like, what would be happening to your printing if you have underexposure? If you do not have a properly exposed screen, one of the biggest signs is going to be pinholing and premature breakdown. You know, you're going to be asking, how can I get more durability out of my emulsion at the press because it's just busting down on me? or trying to hold detail, or you get scum in it as, as you're washing it out. If you do not have an exposure test strip, you know, a Stouffer scale, a 21-step uh, guide is what we would call it at Saudi, but to put a proper exposure to your screen, as you are developing your screen from the substrate side, the side that's touching the t-shirt, that's gonna feel wet all the time, just water wet when you do it. But then if you reach around and you feel from the squeegee side of the screen and it kind of feels like a fish scale, kind of slimy, that's a telltale sign that you're already underexposed and you can find that out in your developing process. But to make sure that you get it right, it is really important that everybody get some kind of an exposure calculator and get that right because a well-developed screen, a well-processed screen is gonna mean success at the press. That seems like an obvious one. Like, I just see people over, but, but how long do I expose my screen? Like, they, they just want, like, the answer, and that's not possible, right? It, it's, hard, it's hard to give them an actual definition because, you know, we got to consider the light source. What are you using? Are you using LEDs? Are you using fluorescence? Are you using mercury vapor? Is your emulsion a dual cure? You know, I mean, find the emulsion that works best to give you the latitude or the chance to screw it up. Um, with what you got. You know, if we can get all of our ducks in a row, you can buy the best emulsion in the world and have a great success. But that best emulsion might not work very well with a, with a, with a uh, fluorescent light. So you have, um, there'll be reclaim and uh, other problems from underexposure as well, right? Absolutely. Um, a screen that's underexposed is going to reclaim much, much harder than a screen that's properly exposed or even overexposed. Underexposure uh, tends to lock in the emulsion a little bit more once it gets hit with a hot solvent. Some emulsions worse than others, but you know, underexposure once again uh, is just the beginning problem for many problems that happen in the entire process. You even get staining, right? More if it's Absolutely. underexposed. Absolutely. Yep. Especially with like diazo-based emulsions that have anything that has diazo in it. If it's underexposed, you can get diazo staining in the mesh as well. So what else you see out there? That's a problem, like a lot of times a problem. Mesh tension, absolutely. I mean, really, when a lot of shops order a screen, they may call up their local distributor and say, send me, I need 10 110 mesh, mesh screens and I need uh, 20 230 mesh screens. We like to be a little bit more specific if you want to create consistency in your facility. Uh, as an example, 230 is a pretty common mesh. Okay, a lot of people use 230 mesh, but do they know that 230 comes in a 40 micron, which is the thickness of the thread? Do they know that 230 comes in a 48 micron? Again, now you have less ink being able to pass through a smaller open area. So you may order a bunch of 230 screens, and as you're coating them, this one will look dark, that one will look light, and you're wondering what the heck is going on, and it, it becomes, that's a pretty common problem that we come across in. So as you order your mesh, I like to really stress it's important to know your mesh, to know your micron, and if possible, your manufacturer, because the different manufacturers will have different tensions and elongations to their mesh as it comes up to tension. So that one is pretty common that we see. Also understanding um, some meshes will not hold tensions for a long time. So it is really important, and I don't see it as often as we should, a tension meter in your shop. Whether you stretch your screens or not, I think it's important that you can control your variables with what comes into your shop with a tension meter. Simply put it on together because as you print jobs, 
you want your tensions to be as close to possible. Uh, Can I just use my screen. thumb and see how much tension's on there? Or bounce a quarter. <laughs> um, so, you know, l lately, it seemed like it used to come to the show and everybody was about like retentionable screens. And that was maybe when meshes weren't so uh, low elongation, maybe. And then it seems like there's a move now. It's like, oh, we're going to go with rigid. But then I see people don't have a tension meter. They don't have a good stretcher. And they don't send them back. So I mean, a screen is not going to last forever with tension, even, even the best uh, meshes, right? I mean, th you're just asking for trouble, it seems like. Do you mean you can't just tape a hole and keep going with it? Yeah, that's what I mean, yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know, how widespread is that when you're going out in shops? I, I just see more and more people not worrying about the tension. They use their screen till it rips. It's, it's more common than it should be. So it, it's really important that if you really want to start developing quality prints all the time, keep your tensions consistent. Set a parameter in your shop. If, you're, if your screen tensions fall you know, 14 newtons or less, that may be your cue to go ahead and throw it away. Um, it will make you more money. It will give you a better print if you keep a better tensioned screen. And, and nowadays, I mean, it, it's so cheap just to have screens stretched for you and sent. You just sent your frames back and have them stretched numerous locations across the country. Just know that you have an X amount of time with that and send it back when it gets bad. I mean, they're going to stretch it. They're gonna, it's going to be back to normal tensions. And, you know, one thing that you didn't touch on with having your screen tensions as close as possible means that you can keep your off contact the same. Otherwise, if your screen tensions are all over the place, your off contact needs to be different, which in turn, you're just not going to be able to register your jobs properly. Yep. So I see some people, quite a few people also don't have the maybe most powerful uh, exposure units. Like, I don't know. That, to me, that I often advise people that's one thing to invest in, whereas it seems like people, you know, because it will expose, they think it's a good exposure. It seems like that's, that would be a place to put your money. Is that maybe the bigger question? Where would you put your money? If you, if you have some extra money, how, what's an easy way to improve things in your screen room? Absolutely your exposure light unit. Um, good drying techniques. But your exposure light is, is really, that's, that's what's going to determine your make or break. Um, I would also say, along with the exposure light, you need to consider your film positive quality. So if, and what I mean is if you can hold that film positive up to the light and see through it, the D-max is what we'd call it, the density, that D-max will be so weak that you will have to underexpose your screen to try and get the details you're trying to hold. So consider your film positives, or if you have a direct-to-screen type unit, you know, what opacity capabilities do those units have? They will definitely translate to a better quality screen. All too often I walk into a shop where I see vellum, you know, which is a common practice. You know, it's cheap, it's easy to start with. You can run it through a laser printer, but there are techniques you can do to darken that vellum a little bit to get more density max out of it and get a better a, a screen closer to the proper exposure. I don't know if I can actually, I, I haven't ever been able to really get a perfectly exposed screen out of vellum and hold all the details that I want. It's, it's next to impossible. So you look at your film positives, that's really a great place to start as well. A good, clear, transparent film positive. If you look at direct to screen, it's kind of important to understand what you're looking at. You know, what I mean by inkjet printers, wax jet printers, or, or laser printers, you know, some that don't use consumables. Understand the densities of what you're trying to accomplish. If you're going to do a lot of half tones, go for that higher D-max on it. Go for a better film positive on it. The better the quality of the film positive, the better your registration as well. I mean, I, I even tell people that can't afford that, like if they're doing lettering type things, that you could probably get away with vellum. If they are doing a halftone job, I mean, just ask somebody to make films for you, right? I mean, that would be an improvement. It's, it's almost impossible to do fine halftone work with vellum, right? Yeah, but even if you are just doing just lettering and stuff like that, you're still underexposing your screen. So say you're doing 100 impressions with something simple like that, okay, you can probably get, get away with it. but. If you've got a really long run, even if it is just simple artwork, you still are underexposing your screens because the, the clear area of the vellum almost blocks as much UV light as the printed area does in most, in most cases. All right. Anything else you see when you go out there? 
Like, <laughs> this is pretty turns common. Turns, yeah, that turns we, we could talk about this for about eight hours and all the different problems that we Oh, yeah, people there. don't know that. We're going to be here eight hours yeah. talking about screens. As, Get comfortable. as we discussed coding techniques, you know, when we do our last passes from the squeegee side so that we build that emulsion over mesh ratio, gravity is still, in effect, working. And I'll see some people take their screens and code them and then just set them standing up in front of a fan and letting them dry. Gravity is still working with that emulsion and dragging it down to the bottom, so you're going to have a thicker EOM on the bottom and a thinner EOM on the top. Or I, I've seen some homemade dryers where people have to put their screen lying substrate side up, yep. which is wrong because gravity is going to pull your emulsion, your emulsion back away from the substrate that you want it to work on. So you really should remember coat your screens, finish it from the squeegee side, and then make sure you lay them flat with the substrate side down so that gravity will work with you. That is a really common problem that we come across. Along with that too, it, it, there's a lot of people that do the DIY drying units that they put like a little space heater in there. And a lot of times those space heaters heat up that drying cabinet far too hot for drying your emulsion. If it's you should always be drying your emulsion under 110 degrees Fahrenheit. If you go above that, it can start to damage your emulsion as well. That actually brings up another topic, which is humidity. Yep. So, I don't know, don't those things cost about 15 bucks that you can put on the wall? At least tells you the humidity in the room. And hygrometer. Yeah, yeah, hydrometer. Yeah, hygrometer. But, yep. I mean, you can buy it at the local hardware store even. It's a, at least a rough idea. I see people that it's like 70% humidity in right. their screen room or 10%, neither is good. Like, where should you be? And, and that seems like a pretty common issue well, as well. And keep in mind, too, emulsion is hygroscopic, too. So if an emulsion, if your screen is completely dry in one environment and you bring it into a humid environment, it's going to suck up It's going to suck up that moisture and it's going to re-wet itself. And if a screen isn't completely thoroughly dry all the way through, once again, it's going to act underexposed. It's going to be a weaker stencil. It's just not going to cross-link properly. When you, uh, I kind of follow this rule of thumb. It was something that I was taught at the Screen Printing Technical Foundation back in the early 90s. Is uh, he wanted you to make, wanted us to make sure that we understood the solids content of our emulsions because, as a general rule of thumb, if you could keep your humidity at or below where your solids content is, that you would be able to have a good stencil. So a lot of the new emulsions today are going to be in the mid to upper 40s, sometimes 50% solids. So if you can keep your screen rooms down below below what the solids content of your emulsion is or super close, you will definitely get a better stencil for it. All right, you know what? Let's, questions. Who's got a question? None of you have ever had any problems in the screen room, right? Not a single one. <laughs> well, while you think about that, I'll ask some more things. So what will you see if uh, like humidity is too high in your screen room? I mean, a lot of people are like, you go someplace, people are reclaiming like, like, in, like wild banshees and the water is yeah. pouring out and they're trying to like dry their screens in the same room with a fan. Like, you know, what are some simple ways around that and, and what are the problems you get if it's too humid in your screen room? Well, along those lines, keeping your, your wet process apart from your dry process is important. Don't do it all in the same room. Have those two separate because like you said, as you're washing out your screens, developing, if you're um, doing your reclaim process, all that water that's going back into the air, now your, your humidity is just fluctuating up and down, and being able to keep that variable much more constant is gonna give you much better results. I mean, I guess if you can't do it, the different times at least, right? Put your screens in a dry absolutely. closet or something and yeah, do your reclaim absolutely. at a different time. I think one of the telltale signs when you have a lot of humidity uh, with the dual cure emulsion, Yep. is you will see a lot more of that diazo staining going on because those emulsions really should be drying for 24 hours. Coat them up, let them go all night long before you shoot them the next day. Um, high humidity and dual cure emulsions just don't coexist well together. You will see a lot more staining from the emulsion in the diazo to the mesh than you would as if you had let it uh, dry properly. So All right, so the question is, they just got an autocoder, that's a good thing, um, and uh, a DTS, and uh, what's, uh, what, what do they want to think about for emulsions for that process? And you said it was an inkjet printer, correct? Correct. And MNRI image? 
the MNRI image has several different ink styles, type K, type D, you know, there's, there's a variety of different inks. And really, as you see, watch those print on your emulsion, you'll be able to see if that emulsion will be capable or not for it. Your emulsion actually has what we call a surface energy. Your ink would have a surface tension, and I, I describe it like when you're waxing a car. We're gonna change the surface, the surface energy of the, of, the, uh, of the hood of the automobile so that when it rains, it beads up. It's the same concept that's happening when you pick one of those different ink series for your, uh, for your inkjet. Um, most emulsions will work. There will be some that it won't be capable of working with, and as it is printed on it, you'll see it beat up and go distressed. So uh, m and does have quite a few different inks that would be able to work to get you put into the emulsion that you want to use, or you could find an emulsion that would be more capable of working with that ink right. that you have in your machine now. Tri use trifecta right now, he says. I mean, we're, we're not gonna get into the specific <laughs> products, obviously, but you know, um, I think more important than the, the product is the environment that you're working in with that. Temperature and humidity of that room is gonna play a huge difference on how that ink sits on that surface of that emulsion. That's, that's far more important than the particular product, in, in my opinion. And then also, you said that you're using the LED. You're gonna to wanna to use something that's faster exposing because with, with LED, you typically have more of a soft exposure. It doesn't get a complete exposure. So it's almost like a, a race to fully expose that screen before light scatter takes over with those LED type systems. Yeah, the that's a that's a really good question, though, which brings up what you both touched on. Printing is a system, and you can't always say like, "What's the best emulsion?" or "What's this?" Yeah. I mean, you're onto something there. All right, we have this uh, coder. We, you know, we got this way to image our screens. So then, what is the best thing? I mean, then you also take into consideration what are you printing, right? What environment are you in? Are you in Arizona with zero humidity, or are you in Maine and it's 50 degrees, and and uh, when you come in and it's like 70 percent humidity? Like it, it seems like there's a lot to it, and you have to consider all of it. I mean, one reason I bring these guys up here, and you should in the show go around it and find experts, is you're going to need help figuring out for your exact situation. I mean, I was talking to Kevin before and, and Dave. It, it, one thing you need is you, it's really hard to figure it out yourself. And you need people that you can trust, that you can ask for the information. And that leads us full circle to the beginning where I said Facebook is not always the best right. uh, way to pick your emulsion. But one thing I'm sure we both can agree on is that trifecta is probably the wrong emulsion for you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Okay, so the question is about water-based printing. I think that's a really good question. So what are the considerations if you're doing water-based printing? What, what do you got to look for in an emulsion or uh, adding a hardener or whatnot? I mean, personally, I, I'm not a fan of hardeners. I think that if you're using the right product with the, the right light source and everything, that you shouldn't have to use hardeners. But one of the, the pitfalls people really dr fall into when they're using water-based inks is they have a water-resistant emulsion, but it doesn't have solvent resistancy. And most of the water-based inks that are out there have some pretty nasty solvents in them as well. So the emulsion needs to be solvent resistant as well as water resistant. Good point. With the, uh, with the water-based printing, you know, I like to say have your ducks in a row. You know, uh, different meshes will give you different adhesion uh, properties. Um, you have degreasers that are specific to help change that surface energy of the fabric so that it'll hold your emulsion better. Um, properly exposed screen, absolutely, that comes back down to water-based printing. Underexposure is just going to kill you. So, uh, you know, with the better emulsions that have come out, the, the hybrids and the pure photopolymers, um, typically a dual cure emulsion, or back in the day when we just had straight diazos, they were great water-based emulsions, but they couldn't hold up the solvent well. So with these new photopolymers, people wanted the faster emulsions, so we had to, you know, we had to consider our solids, we had to consider all the properties, but we had, like, like Kevin said, had to make sure that we had a little bit of solvent resistance to that emulsion as well, because those water-based chemicals do have flow agents that will go after those screens. One of the biggest helps that has been because of photopolymers is even after a photopolymer is developed, 
the emulsion itself will still accept light and continue to cure. So once you have your screens exposed, we, uh, I think most all uh, emulsion manufacturers like to discuss a post-exposure if you don't want to use a hardener. And that post-exposure needs to happen from the squeegee side of the screen as the substrate has already been exposed. So a good post-exposure from a good light source. You like know, the sun. Oh, uh, the sun can be good on it when it's out, <laughs> on but the when right it's day. not. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as, as far as water-based too, if you've got a metal halide light source, the output of that light is gonna be much better match for the emulsion itself. You're gonna have a much thorough burn on your screen versus something like, like I mentioned before, LED, it's more of a softer exposure. It doesn't really get a thorough hardening to that emulsion. So something like a metal halide, you're gonna have much better results with water base as well. I guess it also matters what kind of runs you're doing. If you're doing short run, uh, 48 piece, yeah. you know, in a, on a hand press, it would be different than an auto shop that's running thousands, right? It's a very different animal. If I can say as well, when we're considering uh, exposure times, you know, really LEDs, we have to accept that they're becoming a part of the industry. Metal halide, I absolutely love because I know it covers the whole gambit and gives a great exposure. But LEDs are making a strong, dominant entrance into our industry, so we have to be able to work with them. And the light nanometers of those LEDs will differ. So find a good LED unit that measures about that 405 nanometer wavelength. Um, 385 to 405 is going to be the common ones that you'll see. 385, uh, I typically find that more on an inkjet printer like the iImage. Um, typically, it's a shorter wavelength, so it's less likely to cure out the dots that you're trying to hold with an inkjet printer. Whereas, again, most of our emulsions like to cure at that 405 nanometer wavelength, so if that's what you should really be considering looking at or that metal halide again, that usually covers anywhere from 380 up to 420. So it will cover the gambit of what we need. Another question? All right, the, the question was about, did you hear the question? Yeah, you want to repeat it so that we can have it? So he's asking, what are our thoughts about the focused uh, LEDs like on the starlights where you have a bunch of LEDs that are really close together, close to the screen? Um, they typically have a lot of hot spots to them. So you'll have a good focus point and then kind of a week beyond it and you'll kind of see that pattern show up as, as the screen's being exposed. But an LED that might be further away, you know, a, a cluster of LEDs that are further away, now they're not right up hot on it, it will be able, it, they will do a good job. I think it's important to remember distance when it's talking about any light source um, and the strength of the LEDs. I used to follow the rule of I would take the diagonal of my screen on the emulsion and I'd times that by 1.5 to be aggressive, 1.6 to be good, and that would be a good starting distance um, depending on your light source as to making sure that we can cover your whole screen with a good exposure light. Other questions? Did I, get, did I get that right? Okay. All right. I yeah, don't like I, that. I, we didn't, I misunderstood the question and we answered it. Yeah. Are we good or what? Uh, <laughs> All right. I, I think when it comes to the LED units, it, it really goes back to like distance as well as how many diodes that are in there as well too. There's, there's so many different versions of LED that are out there. And, and then you see the people that are DIYing their own LED systems with diodes that they get on Amazon and all that kind of stuff. Well, one, you don't probably know the wavelength that is really coming out of those diodes as well as the, the mathematics of the distance and how close they are to each other is pretty precise. So, I mean, they're not all made the same. They're not all good. But, um, you know, some are obviously better than others. It is a system, though. I mean, for instance, if you use a, an emulsion with a wider latitude of exposure, then if your exposure unit, you just can't afford to get a, a new one, at, at least that would help, that kind of thing, right? It does help. Yeah. Right? I mean, like I say, if you had all your ducks in a row, you had the right light source, you had the right tension, you had the right prepared screen, the right emulsion for, for the jobs that you want to do, yeah, you're going to have a great experience, but there are some shops where we have to consider, we'd love to put this emulsion in, but we look at your light source and you're not ready to change that out. You can find an emulsion that has more latitude to be able to work with, with your processing. Again, a bigger window of opportunity to screw it up. 
So uh, if, you can, if you can get the right light source, absolutely, it's going to help make it possible for you to get better prints, better screens, better, better turnaround times on them. The light source is huge. And, and with LED, you just have to have everything on point, on target, because, like you mentioned, you know, you're using pure photopolymers. You're using a system that's exposing much faster. So the faster exposing the product is, the less forgiving it is, obviously. So if you could use a metal halide and you could use a dual cure emulsion and you extend that out to the point where the exposure latitude is very wide, it's going to be far more forgiving. You know, some of the pure photopolymers with LEDs right now, you're looking at a, a four second exposure time. If you're off by one second, that's a 25% difference, right? So, I mean, if you don't have everything dialed in precisely, you're going to struggle. You know, um, another issue I just ran into trying to help somebody out was um, like the age of the bulb, you, you know, yeah. right? You want to talk about that? But, like if you have your exposures all set, but your bulb gets old, it can, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. What, what happens then? If you're uh, talking about a metal halide bulb, you have about a thousand hours of life out of a metal halide bulb. And uh, originally- You can use it till it burns out, right? Well, you'd, you'd wish. You'd take, we'll take, and that's a good point. We, we come in and we look at your shop and we look down in your light source and we see this blackened bulb down in there that's all blistered and we're like, when's the last time you changed that out? And the common reply is be like, what? We're supposed to change it out. Do you know how much those bulbs are? They're like 350 bucks. But it's still bright. But it's still bright. It right. still works. Yeah. Metal halide has actually got little metals in there that do burn out. So you will have a bright bulb, but that metal halide is what enhances the penetration of the light source in, into your emulsion. I, I, I like to use the analogy, it's like cooking a chicken. You can cook a chicken at 100 degrees for seven days and it's never going to be cooked properly, right? Because it has to get to the proper temperature to cook properly. Same thing for emulsion, it needs to have the proper amount of UV light before it's actually going to expose properly and cross-link properly. So if your bulb is diminished to the point where it's just not putting the UV light out properly, you're just never going to have a fully hardened stencil. If you're looking right over here at Richard Greaves, he is holding up a Stouffer scale. This is a 21-step guide. You use it like you would use your normal film positive. Put it on a screen that you're going to that you're going to do a job on. It's small, non-invasive. You put it on there. You burn it. Wash out your image and that at the same time. Treat it just like you film positive. When you are done with your image, you look at that and you should see a solid six, soft seven. You know, if you're doing um, direct to screen type stuff. Or if you're using a film poly positive, you should be seeing a solid seven soft, yep. soft eight on that. So. And if you don't have the step wedge or you don't have an exposure calculator, you can just do a step test as well. You know, where you would take a, a piece of blocking material, piece of cardboard and block a portion of your screen, hit it with, say, a given amount of time, move that back, hit it for the same amount of time, move it back. And you're essentially you're having multiple exposure times all on the same screen. That's one way of doing it if you don't have those proper tools, but having an exposure calculator or the step wedge, the 10 step or 21 step, um, either one of those, it's still a way. Just, just know that there's, there's methods out there that you need to use to be able to expose your screens properly and know what your times are. And that goes for every stencil build too. You can't just have one exposure time for all of your screens. But that sounds like it might take an hour or two, and, and I can make a Facebook poll in like one minute and find out my exposure times. Yep, you, you just ask <laughs> what exposure time I, I should have, and, and somebody will just tell you it's 27 seconds. So everybody right now, you should just go out there and expose all your screens for 27 seconds. I can almost guarantee it'll work. All right, well, we probably could talk about screens forever, but I don't think anyone could listen to talk about screens forever. So no. we are um, going to stop here. We'll be around, um, Kevin and Dave. Um, are going to be around if you want to ask them more questions. I'm going to uh, got to thank Impressions for uh, putting on the Shop Talks. I'm from the Ink Kitchen. Thanks to our sponsor, very generous sponsor, Haynes. Rock on. Uh, Jimi Hendrix is going to play the Star Spangled Banner, I think. Um, so anyway, thanks for, to Dave Macon from Saudi. Thanks to Kevin Kyle from Iconics Chromaline, and uh, thanks for coming. We got a whole schedule here, and uh, it's all free. Thank you. Yeah, gr grab each one of us. I'm sure we've got all kinds of literature and stuff. I have one of these. It's the troubleshooting guide. I'm sure they have one as well. But these troubleshooting guides, whether it's the poster form or these, 
just post it in your screen room, and when you have a problem, it's a good reference tool to go back to. I'm sure these guys have one, all of your emulsion re reps have them. All right, how about a hand for Dave and Kevin? All right, thanks. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Rick.